everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today at the Knowledge and Learning Commons, especially during your lunch break. We really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Um, for those of you who are new to the Commons, just a brief introduction to what we do here. Um, we are the Knowledge and Learning Commons, and my name is Natalie. I work at what's called the UN Geneva Library and Archives for the Commons. And this is our space to be able to collaborate together and share knowledge informally across um, the UN Geneva system, specifically on issues of multilateralism and also on professional development. So it's particularly designed for UN staff, diplomats and interns across the UN Geneva system. And so we really thank you for doing joining us in being a part of this. Um, today, we have a very interesting session that's actually been brought to us by Jérôme bellion jourdain who I'll introduce to you with our other speakers um, in just a moment. Um, and today we have a session called Negotiating in a Multilateral World, the potential and challenges of more inclusive uh, negotiations. Now, our speakers wish to look at this particular topic today um, as we mark this year 100 years of modern multilateralism, um, starting with the League of Nations, and also this year the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, um, and beyond that at the present facing many global challenges, including, of course, uh, COVID-19. So here on the screen, you'll see the key session objectives that we'll cover in the next one, one and a half hours. You can see here, um, gain an understanding of the power of negotiation and the role of negotiators in a multilateral context to explore the potential and challenges, to expand the global negotiation table and move towards more inclusive negotiations to address global issues. And finally, hopefully for you to come away with some practical takeaways and insights and tips on negotiation that can also be applied in other professional uh, situations. So there we go. To guide us through this hour and a half, uh, three speakers uh, with an incredible amount of experience. Um, and I will try my best to be able to, to introduce them to you as, as, as meritably as possible. Um, for, in order of speaking, actually, we have Mr. Victor Doprado. He's currently the director of the Council and Trade Negotiations Committee Division at the WTO, the World Trade Organization. Before that, he was also serving as the deputy chief of staff at WTO and also as a Brazilian diplomat and trade negotiator. Also with us is Ambassador Yvette Stevens. She's the former permanent representative of the Republic of Sierra Leone to the UN in Geneva and the WTO. And she has a breadth of experience both in and outside uh, the UN system. Um, but very briefly, she joined the UN system in 1980, working in different duty stations for different UN agencies, including ILO and UNHCR. Um, her last post was as the UN Assistant Emergency Relief Coordinator and Director of OCHA in Geneva. As our former ambassador for Sierra Leone, she also focused on a range of issues, uh, primarily human rights, uh, women's rights, trade and disarmament. And finally, last but not least, we have Jérôme bellion jourdain He is a former negotiator for the EU. He served actually nine years working as the lead EU negotiator on a range of issues and country situations in the UN Human Rights Council. He's currently a senior fellow in residence at the Global Governance Center at the Graduate Institute, where he's actually exploring with other collaborators at the potential for a new initiative on global negotiations. So thank you to all of our speakers uh, for joining. We're going to head over to their faces now so that you can meet them. There is time for Q&A um, towards the end. So we do feel welcome you to write your questions in the chat or to raise your hand. You can see the, the symbol if you're new to MS Teams meeting, you can raise your hand at the top of the screen if you'd prefer to ask a question verbally. We do ask you to please keep your mics, um, mics muted uh, so we can hear our speakers clearly. This session actually is also being recorded, so we, we understand if you would prefer not to be seen, and then we welcome you to turn off uh, your videos. So enough from me, I'll be back later for q and I'll head over to Jérôme first. He'll do a brief introduction to the idea of this session before we head over to all three speakers. Thank you very much, Jérôme. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nathalie. And uh, through you, I'd like to, uh, to thank uh, UN uh, Commons uh, for hosting this event. Uh, I really like this objective of UN Commons as a space for uh, co-creation, collaboration, innovation. And part of what we're going to do today is also to, uh, to look into uh, other ways at looking at negotiation. I mean, I've spent a number of years uh, as negotiator, as you mentioned, on behalf of the EU and the UN. Uh, and had the privilege to work with uh, negotiators from diplomatic missions uh, from uh, the capitals from across continents 
Um, and really, I, I believe uh, the time is uh, really to, to reflect on the role of, uh, of negotiation when we speak about multilateralism. Uh, we live in a world of uh, obviously uh, uh, challenges and, uh, you know, we could list them. Uh, they're quite a long list of the challenges that we need to, to address. Uh, COVID-19 and its uh, social and economic impact is, uh, is one of them, but obviously climate change, environment, biodiversity, uh, inequalities. Um, and, and I think what we see is uh, as we see those global challenges, I mean, there's a trend towards at least some part of uh, retreat to uh, nationalism uh, and, uh, and, uh, and some attempts to undermine uh, multilateralism, uh, while at the same time we see signals uh, for uh, the need for more global cooperation and new ways uh, to uh, to look into uh, the way we uh, we we we, uh, we address those uh, challenges at the global level, and I think what we what we see uh, today is uh, in you know if you take the uh, UN 75 uh, political declaration which is going to be uh, agreed on uh, and uh, which has been agreed and uh, negotiated online and that's also something that will tackle uh, how we do online negotiations. Uh, in, in, uh, in New York and is going to be adopted by the General Assembly later this month, uh, this uh, political declaration uh, seems to uh, show a renewed commitment from states uh, for multilateralism. But I think the purpose of this session is really, uh, if we look at multilateralism, I mean, negotiation is at the heart of multilateralism. In a sense, that's what we tend to do, negotiators, on a, on, on, on a daily basis. But the question is whether we give enough weight and importance to negotiation, to the role of negotiation, but also if we do we do we do enough, I mean, to look at the possible transformations of the way we negotiate, of the formats of uh, of negotiations uh, and uh, and to see whether and that's why we decided to have and I'm thankful that we have the session on on rethinking maybe the format of negotiation and seeing whether we can have more inclusive negotiations and we'll, uh, we'll come back to that uh, at a later stage. As you mentioned, I mean, I'm working uh, currently on a, on a project with uh, uh, with a number of uh, individuals from international organizations, from governments, from uh, business society, and and others. And I like to insist on the others. You don't need to be part of an institution to be to be you know working collaboratively on on, on this project uh, to uh, to precisely look at uh, uh, issues connected to uh, to negotiation and, and and on the first project of a possible uh, virtual and inclusive. Uh, negotiation uh, of uh, guiding principles for negotiators, and we've come back to that uh, after uh, after in the Q and A uh, as well with possible interventions from uh, people working on the on this project with me. Uh, the idea is really uh, to uh, uh, use this uh, space today also to engage with participants uh, and see uh, whether we can uh, also get participants to uh, to help us. Uh, co-created this uh, first uh, draft uh, survey for the uh, uh, creation of uh, uh, a negotiation of uh, getting principles for negotiators. But without further ado, uh, I'd like to uh, obviously give the floor to our uh, two uh, uh, speakers, and I'll come back with a with a with a presentation on my side. Uh, but I'd like to give the floor uh, first to uh, uh, Victor de Prado and Victor. Actually, thankful that uh, you're with us as well as uh, Ambassador Stevens. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Jerome. Uh, thank uh, UN Commons for uh, hosting us. Thank you, Natalie, for the introduction. And I'm very honored to be at the same panel uh, with Ambassador uh, Yvette Stevens and with uh, Jerome Bellion Jourdan. Um, really pleased to be here. Um, a little bit of um, myself. I am speaking uh, on my personal capacity. I still hold uh, the post of director of the Council and Trade Negotiations Committee in the WTO. So whatever I say here is on my own uh, responsibility and everything that I say that is wrong should not be attributed to the WTO or to anybody else and just uh, to me. Um, I'll start with a presentation uh, with three main parts a sort of conceptual consideration um, about multilateral negotiations. I think, uh, as Jerome said, this is a moment when we need to rethink multilateralism. And I think it's good that we just do a little bit of a refresher in our own minds as to what multilateralism really is. How do we negotiate uh, multilaterally? Second, um, second part will be on some uh, considerations of 
negotiating multilaterally in times of COVID, and thirdly, some, uh, some brief uh, conclusions. So starting with, with some uh, conceptual considerations, um, I mean, I'm, I'm more of a practitioner than, than anything. I'm not an academic, uh, but I think it is important that we understand where multilateralism comes from uh, and what multilateralism really, really is. Um, multilateralism, I would say, is not a philosophy. It's not an ideology. It's a method of negotiation, but it's a method that was born out of, of need, of necessity uh, for people to uh, find common solutions to common problems. Um, so it's something that um, has to do with uh, finding uh, solutions um, and of perceived problems that, that are common. Now, common to whom? Um, and here is uh, something that already should make, make us, us think. Uh, basically, multilateral negotiations are still done uh, by governments, that is, nation states. We know how important civil society is. Uh, we know how important uh, multi-stakeholder negotiations are. But in many quarters, and um, I'm fascinated by the comparison uh, between the UN and the WTO, for example, negotiations are basically done uh, by governments, nation states. Uh, if you wish, uh, we can say we live in a Westphalian world. This is a reference, of course, to the Treaty of Westphalia, 1648. And the nation state is the main actor of uh, international relations. So. The question of more inclusive negotiations is, is one that immediately uh, comes, to, comes to mind. Um, multilateral negotiations are also done within a certain context, and the main context is, of course, the international organizations. UN, of course, um, other uh, international negotiation uh, uh, organizations like the ILO, all of the ones that we have in Geneva, and these um, are very recent uh, creations, uh, and I should say they are abstract creations, right? They depend on the willingness of governments to have them. Um, uh, they're different than, you know, countries that have territories and, and um, you know, all of the bells and whistles, populations, and etc. International organizations really are uh, abstract creations that, that depend on on uh, the, the willingness of, of their members to, to exist. And of course, they cover a variety of issues from you know, the, the big issues of war and peace to um, economic, financial, social matters, and et cetera. Uh, when I explain multilateralism to, uh, to my family, for example, I, give, I like to give the example of the World Meteorological um, Organization. You know, meteorology, meteorology is something that uh, basically is done by national authorities. Uh, but the clouds and the weather does not respect the borders. So that those maps that you see while watching television, like the world map with clouds going on, that depend, that's done here in Geneva, uh, in the WMO. And it depends on putting together the information of all of the meteorological um, services around the world. Um, and it depends on the willingness of people to share uh, this, uh, this information. One interesting thing about multilateralism is that it sort of presupposes that people are willing to speak uh, and to find common solutions, not by force. Uh, so the, the force reports, or le rapport de force, as you say in French, are not something that really ties well with, uh, with multilateralism. Um, what are the characteristics of multilateralism? Well, first of all, you have a large number of participants, of course. Uh, they're usually negotiating under um, a selected chairperson who has a very important role to play. Um, the participants usually agree on an agenda, sort of a mandate for the negotiations before the negotiations start. And mind you, this mandate may change with time because multilateral negotiations tend to take time. Um, uh, as we all know, they're not something that you do in a, on a weekend. Um, 
rather in you know in we count multilateral negotiations in years um, and um, of course there's always the question of what is the decision making method uh, of multilateral negotiations are the results going to be done by voting uh, very frequent in the united nations in the wto everything is done by consensus knowing that consensus is not when um, everybody uh, is uh, saying yes consensus is when nobody says no so there's a difference between everybody saying yes and nobody saying no we say that consensus exists when everybody is equally unhappy um, but not too unhappy to to block the uh, the agreement um, one of the characteristics of multilateral negotiations, as we all know, is that you often have alliances between the participants. Um, they form like-minded groups. Um, and these negotiations work better when there are trade-offs, when you can, I give you something on this chapter, you give me something on, on that chapter. Um, not always possible, but it, it works better if there are several issues on a basket that you can uh, that you can negotiate. I mean, the example of going to a uh, to a market or to the souk and saying, let's bargain here, and you bring more things to the basket is a good example. The more things you have in the basket, the easier it gets to negotiate, although that's not, uh, not always uh, possible. And another thing that is very important is that um, small players may have a better chance in multilateral negotiations than they have uh, in uh, bilateral uh, negotiations. Um, now, you should also say in multilateral negotiations that um, it's difficult to negotiate with too many people in the room. You do need to have something like concentric circles of, of, of people. And, and here you get to the question of, you know, this dichotomy between the efficiency of a, a multilateral negotiation versus the legitimacy of the uh, uh, multilateral negotiations. Um, how is my interest being uh, respected uh, or not? Informal setting, super important. We say that multilateral negotiations happen rather in the corridor, in restaurants, uh, in, in walks in the park, than in the real negotiating uh, room. The big deals are not cut in front of everybody. The big deals are basically cut um, in informal settings. Uh, and, and here, the role of people is incredibly important. Jerome is a, is a former negotiator, Ambassador Stevens as well. They can tell you how important the, the personalities are, how important people are. And on this, I would like to recommend to everybody reading a little book by a uh, former Belgian diplomat, Francis Walder. The book is called The Negotiators. Um, in French, it's called Saint-Germain ou la Négociation. Uh, it's the story of French Catholics and Protestants negotiating in which cities of France in the 16th century, the Protestants, the Reformed Church could practice their rituals. Uh, it's a fantastically difficult negotiation because it puts in, in on the table dogmatic things, religion, I believe something you don't believe and you believe something which I don't believe and there's no negotiation there, and territory, and territory is, is finite, of course. There's only so much land where you can do things. So those are particularly difficult negotiations when you mix land and religion um, very current as, as, as well, not only in the 16th century. Um, so, and in there, the negotiators uh, show how we, they manage a negotiation, uh, they manage to find a, an agreement, but there you see how important personalities, cultural issues, emotions are to, uh, to all of this. Um, I do want to say a word, and uh, Jerome is going to expand on a survey that uh, he is uh, doing on um, non-state actors, different stakeholders uh, that should increase the role of um, the legitimacy of negotiation, especially because government agents not always have the expertise, government agents, uh, agents not always know everything that is going on. 
um, and, and, and have the feeling of what is important uh, in the world. I mean, if we think about climate, we know how important uh, non-state uh, stakeholders are. Uh, short uh, considerations of my own experience in uh, helping set up multilateral negotiations in the last months, uh, especially since uh, March, and this is sort of the second part of my of my presentation. The limits to physical interaction. I was saying how important it is for people uh, to 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 be there. The neg multilateral negotiations are really highly dependent on people. Limits to travel, limits to physical interaction have taken a toll on multilateral uh, negotiations. And we've basically been negotiating, well, not so much uh, in the last weeks, but surely in the first uh, weeks, March, April, uh, only through virtual platforms. Uh, so we had to relearn how to interact, uh, seeing lots of little faces and heads like we do here uh, in, in a, in a, on a screen, uh, not, not always comfortable, and uh, lots of challenges. Uh, in the WTO, for example, we define consensus as uh, when no WTO member present at the meeting when the decision is taken formally objects to it. Now, how do you define present at the meeting? Does virtual presence count? Or do you have to be physically present at the meeting uh, to have a decision taken? Um, big, big issue. And I think different people have different views and different people, depending on the issue that are that is being negotiated, will have different views. And, and I would say that um, if the issue on the table is really sort of a technical issue, it's easier to negotiate than when the issue becomes incredibly political. Not that technical issues don't have a political taint to it, to them, they, they do, but the less politicized the technical issues are, and I have an experience on negotiating um, a uh, e-commerce uh, agreement, uh, the, the more technical, the easier it is for people to come to, uh, to some sort of understanding. Uh, if the issue gets very political with different points of view uh, amongst governments, then, then things become more difficult. And, and I would suggest that there the physical interaction um, is, uh, is more important. Um, we have struggled with uh, things like how confidential is it to negotiate or even to speak on a platform like this? How can people hack? What platform uh, can we use? Um, some governments have restrictions on the use of certain platforms. You probably know about this. There are some platforms that people claim are more, are easier to hack than other uh, platforms. So they say, my government doesn't allow me to even even log in to a platform like this, let alone express my government's position on this platform. Um, questions of language. Uh, we're all speaking English here. Um, people will insist that a platform caters for different, for interpretation, for different languages. Um, uh, easier to do when you're in a room with the interpreter's booths. Uh, clearly more difficult when you're here. And the interpreters themselves are not always keen on doing the interpretation when they don't see people in the room because they would claim that the body language is part of the communication. So negotiating uh, uh, through another language in a, a virtual platform um, is, um, is, is more difficult. Um, loads of other questions, and I'm, I'm fascinated by uh, what uh, Jerome said that the UN is coming up with some uh, principles and uh, on on how to negotiate um, on on virtual meetings. I think this is something that is very uh, important. On on the plus side, I would say there is um, there's increased participation. We've seen this in the WTO since we restarted physical meetings with physical distance, with all of the you know precautions 
you cannot enter the WTO premises, for example, without having your temperature taken. Everybody needs to wear a mask while uh, in the corridors and etc. and disinfectants. Still, what we have seen is that lots, there's more participation um, because we're doing hybrid meetings, partly physical, partly online. Um, you see an increased participation and you also see the participation of capital based people. Um, which is which is very interesting. Like, again, more expertise because you have people being able in capitals in different parts of the world being able to participate in meetings that are organized here in Geneva. Now, for some delegates, it's a bit less comfortable because the the that phrase, "Thank you, Madam Chair," I will transmit the question of the honorable delegate to my capital and get back to you. Well, that doesn't work any longer because your capital is there. Um, so um, it gets it gets trickier here if you have lots of people from uh, from capitals. But clearly, uh, in 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 some instances, it gets more interesting and more legitimate. I would I would claim uh, as well, not question the legitimacy of anyone being in Geneva. But um, it 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 is a more interesting uh, type of uh, of of discussion. Um, I'm going to conclude saying that multilateralism um, in, a, in and of itself is a very challenging method. It's easier to negotiate bilaterally, uh, but it is a, it is a necessary one. And, and, I, and I would say on, on a very personal basis that I think uh, it's very important that people continue to support multilateralism. Uh, if anything, because multilateralism is a method that does not lend itself to extreme positions. We're in a world where people are used to taking very polarized, very extreme positions. Well, you will not get anywhere in a multilateral negotiation if you don't abandon some of your polarized views of your extreme views and you try to understand what the other one is saying, uh, what everybody uh, is saying, if you're not able to read the room, as people say, um, if you're not able to abandon excess. Um, and, and here I, I go back to, you know, the, the, the virtues of, of being of moderation, something that is inscribed already in the Temple of Apollo in the Oracle in Delphi. There is one of the principles there that says nothing in excess. So the virtue of moderation is super important. And this is something that is very important in multilateral uh, negotiations. Abandon the excess, abandon the extremes, because a multilateral negotiation will only be successful if you, if you find the common ground amongst a lot of uh, people. So building bridges, uh, being able to, to understand different points of view, different interests, different positions, is, is very important. And I would finish by saying what is also important is to be to be able to believe that a multilateral negotiation can be successful, to believe in ideas, to believe in ideals with an with an L, uh, to keep the utopia. I mean, people say, well, uh, peace in the world is an utopia. But if we are working for international negotiations, if we are working for multilateral uh, multilateral settings, we have to believe that these things, difficult or maybe impossible as they seem, are still um, utopias and ideals that are important to, uh, to keep in our minds. Thank you very much, uh, Natalie. Thank you, Jerome. Thank you very much, Mr. Victor Prado. Over to Ambassador Stevens. You'll just have to unmute your mic, I think, Ambassador Stevens, so we can hear you. And let me start again by thanking the UN Commons and Jerome for involving me in these discussions. Um, my presentation, in my presentation, I'll be looking particularly at the role of small states 
in negotiations because when we say multilateral um, negotiations, it's sometimes understood that all states are at the same level in terms of negotiations. I want to say that if we're looking at inclusiveness, we have to look at the role of small states and how that could be improved um, in negotiation. That's what I'll be covering here. I will start with looking briefly talking, and I think um, I think Victor has set the pace for me, so that saves me a lot of time on looking at the state of negotiations in Geneva, the problems faced by small states, some of the solutions which are actually occurring but could be more consistent, and also looking at examples of small state successful negotiations and the lessons to be learned from that. I'll give you a few examples. And then I look at briefly at the role of non-state stakeholders in negotiations. I will be presenting my experience, first of all, as acting as secretariat for negotiations within the UN, and later as representing a small state in negotiations here in Geneva. So firstly, let us look at I mean, the state of negotiations. I think we all know that in most of the areas covered by in Geneva, there are negotiations of some sort be they resolutions, be they agreements, but there are negotiations in most of them. And um, we all know, and I think that came out clearly from Victor's presentation too, that negotiation involves you know, confrontation, decisions, getting together, understanding each other's um, uh, uh, point of view, and trying to get to one at the end of the negotiation. A negotiated settlement um, is, as Victor also says, it's not that everybody is happy, and nobody is unhappy. And I think that is extremely important to know. Now, what are some of the problems faced by small states? First of all, we talk about negotiation, but there's a need, it's an art in itself. And there's a need for people to be conversant with the art of negotiations. Because I have seen that for many states that have one person covering all the different elements, that basically the art of negotiation itself is absent. And I believe that is an important complement that could be done to train people on the art of negotiation. That would help a lot um, in terms of the quality of negotiations that we have here in Geneva. Then, of course, the absence of the, in the negotiations of um, critical periods of the negotiations of small states. We all know that the missions are small. At the same time, we have simultaneous negotiations in WHO, in WTO, human rights. And we probably have one person covering these, um, these, these areas. And so it's not possible to be there all at the same time. And important moments in negotiations are missed by small states, purely from the point of view that they do not have the capacity to cope with all the negotiations that are taking place. Then also sometimes it's access to technical information. And I believe that the technical information that is required to have a successful ne negotiation is not always available to some states. And I'm talking specifically of, of, of small states. Then also there is a danger, and I'll say this because I'm speaking on my own behalf, right? I don't, <laughs> the danger that sometimes when, um, when there's sensitive negotiations taking place, there's also a danger of being used by powerful states, you know, to support their own interests. And I've seen this time and time again, that some small states are supporting something because they have been convinced by some country, powerful country, that they should support it. But when you look deeply into it, it's not in the interest of their particular state. So that also is a problem which is faced by countries. When you do not have the sufficient technical knowledge, when you do not have the interaction with your capital that you should have often enough, then there's a, there's a problem that you could be co-opted by stronger states to, to, to support their position. And this is usually not desirable. So what are the solutions? As I said, I'll go on to the solutions. And some of them are already occurring, but as I said, more consistently, these need to be done. First of all, I believe that there should be courses on the art of negotiation somewhere in the system within Geneva for new um, diplomas. The same as we have briefings, et cetera, et cetera. This could be something that would be extremely useful. Then, um, well, some of the measures that have come that have come in play, into play because of COVID-19, where it is possible to interact with the capitals, more often that could also serve the purpose of negotiators representing small countries in Geneva having to contact with their capitals. Because what happens is that sometimes you send the text to the capital 
and the negotiations are going on. And the pace of the negotiation here is such that by the time you get their comments, the negotiation has got, the subject has gone to the next stage. So basically, having this regular contact through, and I'm, I'm so happy that um, one of the positive elements of the COVID-19 is that before when you spoke about virtual consultation, everybody shrunk, oh no, but now it's acceptable. So I think that is something that could be utilized to advantage, to advantage of having small states actually communicating with their capitals, all the technical people in their capitals to make sure that when they come to the negotiations, they are well equipped to portray the interests of their own country. Then um, it's also important to have getting information on issues being discussed. Um, it's true that we have this group of countries negotiating groups, and I think Victor um, referred to like-minded groups, but also we have the, the regional groups. But I think there's one thing also, because like from a small country, let's say the, the African regional group, the country we are so different, there are 50, 52, 53 countries in Africa with different interests. So one thing that one has to be ensured as a small country, when, the, when we are doing this group negotiation is that the group itself is sensitive to the needs of the smaller members of the group. And I know that within the African group, I kept bringing up this point. I said, yeah, 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 we have this big country is going to negotiate, but what about us? But that is something that is extremely important when we work in these groups. And also we can use the strength within the regional groupings to represent, um, yeah, I mentioned that before. Um, also, I think also one has to say that when we are, when we are negotiating um, different, different documents, that we also have the specialized agencies of the United Nations here offering briefings. And again, the, the terms of capacity of being in different places also affects the, 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 the smaller countries. But these briefings are usually there. And I also think that also um, one thing that is extremely important has been the, the, the specialized groups of non-state um, stakeholders. I have found that extremely useful. And um, I will come that when I, back to that when I come to the examples. I believe that many NGOs are, have specialized in particular fields, and I personally have benefited from their advice when it comes to negotiating in the, uh, um, among states. That are some things I was, not aware, I was not aware about, even though I was a negotiator for my small country, I got all that information and all the knowledge I got a lot from non-state stakeholders, from NGOs, particularly specialized in the subject that's under review. Also, I think one thing I think I mentioned that which comes from knowing the art of negotiation, that every state can achieve, not every state can achieve everything it wants. Because sometimes we see some, some negotiators come and say, this is it. And they are not willing to back or to, and that doesn't help either. I will go on to give some examples of what I would consider successful um, negotiations from the perspective of small countries. And I think, Victor, you would be um, <laughs> you would be pleased to note that I would particularly refer to one negotiation at WTO. WTO is known as um, you know somewhere where the consensus, and that is very difficult. But one thing which I have I have taken part in, and which I think is worth noting is the negotiation on the trade facilitation agreement. I think this was the one major agreement that WTO has succeeded in since its creation. And I think a lot of, it should be used as a model, I would say, huh? because what happens in that negotiation is that, um, is that, first of all, we had a lot of briefing on third, we had South Center also briefing us, and I, for me it was important. The South Center, the things I learned from the South Center, I didn't know, and I was representing my country in the negotiations. So I thought that was extremely important. But there were groups, there were various groups, you know, the least developed country is a group within WTO, and it's given a voice, and that is extremely important, because I think the least developed countries we could get together we, we identify our common interests and bring it to the negotiation table at the general session. We could first of all pass it to the African group or whoever, but the, the least developed countries sit down and negotiate. And this is where also the whole question of, of chairmanship of a negotiation becomes important. Because for that particular agreement, we were, we were having negotiations throughout the night. As Victor would tell you, we go to the WTO at three o'clock, we finish at seven in the morning. 
But we, what the chair, when there was any question, he would break the negotiations and we'll go and meet back in an LDC group and say, okay, this is what is on the table. How do we get something out of it that is of benefit to us? I found that was extremely important. And if anybody wants to look at the trade facilitation agreement, you will find that this is one agreement where the whole question of special and differential treatment for least developed countries come out clearly. The negotiations themselves, the agreement itself makes concessions for least developed countries to make them feel a part of the whole process. And everybody came out reasonably happy with the whole um, outcome. I think it should serve as an agreement. I know most of the time in these agreements, we do not consider that some countries are worse off. And the whole question of special and differential treatment becomes a bit of a political debate. But there it was there in concrete form. Another successful um, 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 negotiation it was on the Sendai framework for disaster reduction. I know that at the time it was in the wake of the Ebola crisis. And um, we went to the negotiations here in Geneva and being a country that was affected by this crisis, my point was that, yes, you, we should include epidemics and pandemics as natural disasters. Because for, as far as we were concerned, these are the worst natural disasters that have affected us. And so there were a lot of, you know, to, to and fro because most countries, are, no, these are natural disasters, pandemics and epidemics belong to WHO. But at the end of the day, it was accepted and, and included in the Sendai framework. And this paved the way for um, 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 prevention and preparedness for pandemics and epidemics being a part and parcel of the Sendai framework. We should also compare countries to pay attention to that, to looking at preparedness and prevention of epidemics and, and, and pandemics when looking at the whole scene of disasters. Then, of course, there's the Treaty of the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Now, for as long as this remained under disarmament, it was difficult because small countries would say, yeah, but the nuclear, what, 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 what do we have in that? But then a few countries took it, brought out the humanitarian aspects of, the, of nuclear weapons. And I believe from a series of meetings which were held in which, in which there were, there were, people were brought forward to give their uh, manifestations, people that had been affected by nuclear weapons came out and made the case so forcibly and small countries were then willing to go behind and support the agreement which was approved by the General Assembly eventually. There was also, I mean, I could give a bit, in WHO, for instance, again, after the epidemic of the Ebola, when we were discussing a resolution for, um, for um, improving the, the, the capacity of WHO to respond to pandemics, that one, we, we small states had a voice because we could bring out where immediately had just been touched by this Ebola and we could make a, a strong point. I would end by looking at the role of non-state stakeholders. As I said before, NGOs play a crucial role in negotiations. And I would particularly bring up the whole negotiations, especially in disarmament. If you look at the landmine treaty, this was something that was that was really the, the result of work by NGOs, if one has to admit it. And there are many other things too. And now we are discussing the um, um, <laughs> we are this um, the I say we because I'm no longer a part of it. They are discussing the whole implications of um, 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 lethal autonomous weapons, and we are getting a lot of you know feedback, you know, briefings, reports, etc. from NGOs. NGOs can play a crucial role in negotiations, of course, doing the background research, which sometimes states small states are not in a position to do. Um, coming out with relevant publications and briefings and having a strong advocacy for um, um, in, in these de ne negotiations. Private sector increasingly can play a role, playing a role in e.g. in business and human rights, although we can argue that the guiding principles on business and human rights was not a negotiated document, but the involvement of, of, of the private sector in that could serve as a possibility for developing further the role of private sector in, in multilateral negotiations. And on that note, I will end my presentation and I will be prepared to respond to any questions which anybody might have for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Stevens, for your insights. Our final speaker now, over to you, Jérôme. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd like really to, uh, to thank Ambassador Stevens and Victor uh, De Prado, uh, Yvette and, uh, and Victor. I mean, uh, I think you've uh, set the scene uh, in a way which uh, makes it uh, uh, every, you know, even more difficult for me to come in at this stage. Uh, and it's always difficult, as you know, to be, to be last uh, to speak. And I think I'll probably adapt a bit what I'm going to, uh, to speak and react to some of the points that, uh, that have been made. Uh, and then go into uh, into the issue of uh, rethinking the formats of uh, of negotiations and uh, looking forward on uh, what what it is that we can do in that space. Uh, I think what we've heard, I mean, from uh, from Yvette, I mean, the art of negotiation, and uh, we've also uh, heard from Victor. I mean, the, what I've experienced as a, as a negotiator is uh, really this power of negotiation, and, uh, and I think a strong belief that any negotiator at the start of a negotiation should have uh, that. Uh, it is possible, uh, even in polarized situations, even in situations where you know we can feel that the the tension and the conflicts from uh, from the wider world uh, could impact on the negotiation. To see whether we as negotiators uh, can uh, turn the impossible into uh, into the possible, and that's really uh, a conviction in the sense that uh, if we work at the multilateral level, uh, negotiators uh, uh, often have uh, to uh, to find that common ground and, and all what it requires. Uh, Victor, I mean, I mentioned the, uh, the, the, the importance of listening and, uh, and listening is, uh, is for me, I mean, uh, uh, you know, something that is uh, vital for any negotiator to, to listen to all the parties, to uh, get into more understanding, building trust of uh, where the parties in a, in a multi-term negotiation come from. And that's obviously challenging in a multi-party uh, negotiation, but that's uh, uh, indeed uh, uh, the the way uh, we can uh, we can find uh, uh, ways forward uh, uh, and, uh, and a possible common ground. Uh, Yvette, I mean, mentioned uh, quite a lot about uh, the strengthening the capabilities of, uh, of, of negotiators and, and also the limitations that uh, that small states uh, uh, can face. And I think that's uh, something I can only agree uh, with. That uh, uh, indeed, I mean, we are in a situation where negotiators are not necessarily all equipped in the same way. Uh, to uh, to prepare for negotiation, to engage in negotiations, and there's uh, so much that uh, can be done uh, also in the in the side of uh, uh, to training, and there are excellent providers of training for negotiation. Uh, but the question is uh, whether that's accessible to all negotiators is also a question of, uh, and that's where in the space that we're trying to, uh, uh, to 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 work on now, we are also thinking of other ways of uh, strengthening the capabilities of uh, of negotiators uh, by, uh, for instance, having uh, a way to have a peer-to-peer -peer exchange between negotiators to, uh, to, uh, to build on the wealth of knowledge. And we've heard from, uh, uh, from Yvette, from Victor, uh, this wealth of knowledge uh, from negotiators, past negotiators, possible mentorship uh, between uh, uh, experienced negotiators and others who are new to, uh, to, to the scene. I think there's so much that can be done to strengthen the capabilities of negotiators so that uh, we are all equipped when we engage in negotiations uh, to make uh, uh, that all the efforts that are required to, to reach that, uh, that common ground, uh, common ground to satisfy what is uh, important for the parties around the table, but also bearing in mind that's also the spirit in which we work, uh, what is good for, for, the, for the whole. I mean, uh, you know, a negotiation is, uh, is, uh, is good if we have an agreement in the best case between the negotiating parties. But then the question arises as to whether this negotiation has generally an impact uh, on the uh, on the whole, on the on the people, on the planet, uh, and we know that in the in the current stage, I mean, we we directly, uh, need that. Um, I'd like maybe to to say a bit more about the format of negotiations, and I think we've heard uh, from both Victor and uh, and Yvette that uh, obviously the current system of uh, negotiations, a system of uh, of intergovernmental uh, uh, negotiations, and that's uh, the way it's been uh, uh, set up. Uh, before I go into that. Uh, if we look at the, the way we negotiate in an intergovernmental setting, I mean, there's also maybe ways uh, to better connect between uh, different uh, negotiations. Uh, I think what we see in the scene of negotiations is a fragmented scene of negotiations where there are different negotiations in parallel on different uh, issues uh, and different fora, uh, and, uh, and the, the links are not necessarily made between, between the various, uh, various sectors. Uh, in a situation where we all acknowledge that uh, most of the issues are interconnected, but also that there are global issues uh, that uh, should be borne in mind as we enter into any negotiation. So that's uh, uh, one of the ways uh, to maybe rethink the way 
uh, we, we, we negotiate. And there are, you know, interesting initiatives in that field that, uh, you know, uh, was part uh, last year of a workshop organized by the Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie. Uh, je voudrais parler peut-être en français, but I will not uh, switch to French because we don't have interpretation. I think uh, Yvette uh, or Victor mentioned language. Uh, language negotiation, we often say uh, that language uh, has to do, uh, is, uh, is we have the, the six UN languages, but in fact, most of the negotiations, the real negotiations, the negotiations that happen in the rooms, uh, happen without uh, interpreters and, uh, and, ha and are in English. So I think that's, uh, that's definitely, uh, uh, definitely an issue. Uh, so the, this workshop of the uh, Francophonie was, uh, you know, brought together negotiators from uh, trade, uh, climate, and digital from uh, several uh, African countries. And that's, I think, the idea of bringing negotiators from different fields, different areas, uh, to see what is it that uh, can be do, done to build bridges between uh, different spheres of, uh, of negotiation. But let me go to, uh, uh, to the format of uh, the integral format of negotiation. In this, that's the way uh, the, the, the system, in a sense, has been set up. If we take the UN by the uh, UN Charter, um, uh, there's maybe one notable exception, which is the uh, International Labour Organization, where we have a tripartite uh, system of, uh, of negotiation with governments, employers, and uh, and workers. Uh, but it's true that uh, you know, and I've been part of that. Uh, negotiations are driven by states or uh, negotiators on behalf of a group of states, um, and I think that what we've seen over the years is uh, that the the space has opened to other stakeholders. Uh, Yvette mentioned the role of, uh, of NGO society, um, and, uh, and I think we can all agree that, uh, for instance, we take the UN, uh, we have an increasing number of uh, NGOs and other international organizations that are of an observer status uh, in, in the UN and, uh, and that can contribute and, uh, uh, you know, with advocacy, with uh, uh, you know, providing information to states, and that, I think that's a vital information, uh, a vital role of uh, of NGOs. Um, but I think what we also see is uh, uh, a situation where the UN has uh, increasingly uh, engaged uh, with uh, stakeholders. Um, uh, you know, Yvette mentioned the, the way uh, the guiding principles on business and human rights have been uh, elaborated. Uh, with uh, engagement of uh, of business and uh, and civil society, along with uh, governments, uh, uh, before they were adopted by the UN uh, Human Rights Council, but we see it also in the sphere of uh, climate change, of uh, even the 2030 agenda, and the way uh, it was uh, it, it was uh, it, it was prepared uh, in the sphere of uh, digital uh, cooperation as well. Uh, but I think the question today is, uh, we see that there are you know, all this has happened, but they increasingly calls also for a more inclusive multilateralism. Uh, and this is something that we hear increasingly, uh, even from the highest level and from the Secretary General of, uh, of the UN, uh, Guterres, who, you know, for instance, back in, uh, back in April uh, for the International Day of, uh, of, uh, of the Multilateralism, and he's uh, referred to that need of, uh, of uh, better interaction with uh, a range of, uh, of players from business, civil society, uh, local authorities, and in fact, uh, last week, I mean, uh, when I engaged uh, uh, and addressed the uh, uh, centenary summit of the International uh, Organization of Employer, uh, we could see that uh, he's made a, an even clearer call for uh, an inclusive multilateralism. And I think the question is, what is it that we can mean by that? I mean, is there a possibility uh, in the system as we have it of uh, intergovernmental negotiations, of negotiations driven by governments uh, to expand, in a sense, the negotiation table in a way where we can include um, uh, other stakeholders. Uh, and that's what we're working on now with uh, a, a number of um, uh, individuals from uh, uh, working in the team with me to see whether we can expand this uh, negotiation table to stakeholders like business, uh, trade union, civil society, but also test it maybe uh, and take it to a later, uh, another stage, which would be to have a global negotiation uh, scene whereby uh, individuals without having necessarily uh, an affiliation or a, a representation uh, could be plugged in and be part of a, of a global uh, negotiation. What is rational for that? I think uh, Victor rightly mentioned the, 
the right balance between efficiency and uh, and uh, and legitimacy in a, in a negotiation. And indeed, uh, that's one of the issues that we are uh, trying to tackle as we uh, prepare for this uh, virtual and uh, uh, inclusive negotiation that we're working on. But I think we can see uh, that there are a number of assumptions to be to be tested if we were to go for more inclusive negotiations. The first one would be obviously to empower people to to participate in uh, uh, in global negotiations, and and that would be in line with uh, the 2030 agenda. And decided that we should leave no one behind. Uh, the second one is really decided that. Uh, and it's an assumption that if we involve more people in the preparation of the negotiation, but also at the negotiation table, we may have a better outcome. And, and that can also lead to a better buy-in and commitment for, for, for implementation. So we are fully aware of the challenges and, uh, and, uh, and, and you know, when we say inclusiveness, I mean, what is it that we mean, for instance? I mean, do we mean uh, formal and passive inclusiveness or really what, what is it that we can do to, uh, to go for genuine inclusiveness? Uh, also fully aware that when it comes to uh, online uh, negotiations, and we've just at the beginning of that uh, uh, with uh, uh, the development of online negotiations, uh, you know, we have an issue of bridging the, uh, the digital divide and the fact that uh, many people on earth uh, do not have access to internet, do not have access to, to equipment, so how to uh, have them engaged uh, in, uh, uh, in, in a global negotiation. This is work in progress and that's something that uh, we would like to uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, co-create and discuss with uh, with all of you today uh, with uh, with the first step, which is uh, that uh, before we launch what could be a virtual negotiation, an inclusive negotiation, uh, uh, we would like to test with you the possibility of uh, of crowdsourcing the first contribution uh, to this uh, negotiation. Uh, the idea again is, uh, you know, often in negotiations, one party comes with a draft uh, and then the others react. Uh, is to see whether we could also go forward for models where we uh, try to contribute, uh, to get contributions uh, before we elaborate a, a draft. And in fact, what you will have, uh, hopefully, uh, we, we will rely on you to engage, is uh, to test the first survey, uh, or first draft of this survey uh, that we uh, uh, have uh, elaborated, it's a very, very first draft, uh, to see uh, uh, how it works and, uh, and get your contributions, but also your reactions uh, to see whether we could elaborate a set of uh, guiding principles for negotiators, something that would, if we are successful and manage to uh, uh, to work in that direction of a negotiating uh, agreement on a, on a set of guiding principles for negotiators, uh, would be something that would be useful, uh, obviously also for uh, negotiators in uh, in the future in the way they engage with uh, in future negotiations. Um, so I think I'll. I'll leave it there for now. I'm happy to take obviously uh, questions, but please uh, do uh, feel uh, uh, free to engage uh, on the initiative itself, but also most importantly to to, to react on this uh, first draft and engage on uh, completing this uh, first draft of the, the guiding principles for negotiators. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to you, Jérôme. And as you can see now on the screen, it is the QR code for the survey that Jérôme mentioned. So throughout the Q&A, uh, please feel free to to fill it in if 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 you have um, the time now, that would be great. Or um, right after the session, we'll also send it to you via email if that's if that's easier for you. Um, I'm also yes, we've just got a question that it be also pasted into the chat. We will do that for you now. So you should now see um, the URL coming up. There we go. So you can see that now from me if you'd prefer to, to, to fill it out on the, on the desktop. Thank you very much to all. So we now have about half an hour for Q&A and it would be wonderful to hear from you. We actually have quite a few questions already. So we're going to try and get to as many as possible. If we don't get to all, our sincere apologies, we will keep the chat history so that our three speakers still can and can take consideration of your questions as well. Um, but let's start firstly with um, Jill Bagerman because I know you had the first question. Um, it is, uh, I have a question on the efficiency of small nation or the legit legit legitimacy of a, a large nation. What characteristics should be used to find the right size number of representatives at the negotiation table? And in reality, why do the characteristics of peace negotiate tours, I, I think it could also be negotiations, almost always exclude non-combatants and women, even if they are also combatants? So, she says, thank you for your insights. Um, this one we will pass over to Jérôme. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, uh, Nathalie, and, uh, and many thanks for this uh, first question. I think what we are reflecting on when we uh, speak of inclusive negotiations at the global level, uh, obviously something that uh, I know uh, many uh, have been struggling with as to what is it that we can do in uh, other settings of negotiations uh, and uh, particularly in situations of uh, conflicts um, and, uh, and how to resolve conflicts and, and who should be part of a negotiation uh, at, at the national level. I don't think there's a, you know, by definition, I think there's no, no one answer as to uh, to the right number of uh, participants that should be around a negotiation negotiation table. I mean, I think there's uh, obviously this varies from uh, from situation to situation. Criteria have to be established. There are also different ways of uh, of uh, conducting a negotiation uh, and having also uh, different uh, groups, uh, uh, and that's definitely what we're thinking of when we go for inclusive uh, negotiations. Uh, it doesn't have that we have a, a plenary with a, with a, uh, with too many negotiators to the point that nobody can listen uh, and uh, and uh, and that's uh, impossible to to manage. Uh, but possibility of of small groups uh, and uh, so I think there are different settings that can be established to to have uh, as inclusive as possible the, the negotiation process. Thank you very much, Jérôme. Before we head over to the floor, we see a few hands raised. There is a question from Sakshi Kakar to, to Mr. Dobrado. In a multilateral negotiation, can there be a wrong and a right, or does everything remain relative and subject to consent? I know you wish to, to reply to that, so over to you, Victor. Thank you very much, uh, Natalie. Now, I, a fascinating question, and I cannot um, uh, refrain myself from quoting from that book that I mentioned by Francis Walder, uh, there is a moment there in the negotiation when one of the characters says the following. And, you know, this is a book that I've read many times, so I, I, I know these quotations almost by heart. It says, the, the, uh, this character in the book says, and it's a negotiator, right? Truth is not the opposite of lying. Treason is not the opposite of servitude. Hatred is not the opposite of love. Trust is not the opposite of mistrust, nor is honesty the opposite of falsehood. You could think that this is, oh my God, this person really is, you know, doesn't have very high standards. Well, as a negotiator, and, and I'm sure Ambassador Stevens will know this, as a negotiator, you are often working in a sort of a middle ground in a gray area you you know when when the character says that uh, lying is not the opposite of truth if a negotiator asks you what is your position on this you cannot always disclose your full position you don't want to disclose your 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 end game right but you don't want to lie either because if you lie you lose the credibility so it's it's very difficult. It's a it's an art negotiation, and and you are often in in the sort of middle ground. So what is right and what is wrong? Well, this is really subjective. What is right for one may not be for the other, and what is wrong for one may not be wrong for the other. The important thing is to understand the position of each other and try to find the common ground. Sorry for the long reply, but you know I, I truly believe that we we need this sort of bridge building. We need to find what are the interests because if you you say I am completely right and you are completely wrong, then you're not going to get anywhere. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's head over to some of the, the hands being raised. Uh, I see here Marcia Canero de Oliveira. Would you would you like to take the floor? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Union Commons, for holding this event. And uh, I'm part of the inclusiveness group of this project with uh, Jerome. And Jerome invited us to uh, briefly explain what we are doing in relation to uh, ensuring inclusiveness in the project. So I would like just briefly to introduce you to this topic. Uh, we are six highly movement, uh, motivated volunteer members, Abigail Robinson, Radhika Sibyl, Jeffrey Selling, uh, Tom Miles, Albidulaziz, and myself. 
uh, we've started with the idea that the interests of absent parties are hardly ever taken into account in, to, in negotiations. So one needs to be somehow represented at the negotiation table to be able to make a difference. Inclusiveness, however, we understand rarely occurs spontaneously. Hidden and explicit barriers accumulate and only tiny privileged groups end up actually taking part in impactful conversations. Worse, the fortunate ones are almost ever aware of their privilege. This is what we call privilege blindness. To escape this trap, we propose in this uh, project practicing active inclusiveness through transparency and engagement. The methodology would involve four steps aiming at raising awareness about the absence of excluded groups and encouraging all participants to be part of the solution. In this, in, in this direction, we identified identified five structural causes of, causes of exclusion, namely gender, origin, race, income, and age. And we decided to take action upon them. Let me give you an example. Suppose that we establish a target representation for each gender at a minimum of 40%. This is step one. The collection of disaggregated data will then identify the proportion of male and female participants. It's step two. In case women make up to less than the established target, another representation is identified and should be announced to all participants. This will be step three. Every participant will therefore be encouraged to spread the word among potential female participants and invite them to join the process. Step four, the proposal is based on the principles of collective responsibility and collect collective action against the structural exclusion in global negotiations. It aims also at overcoming privilege blindness through awareness raising, transparency and engagement. Besides that, the inclusiveness group is also addressing important cross-cutting issues such as environmental concerns, how to bring earth to the negotiation table, language as a barrier, safeguarding participants, bridging the digital divide and the intersectionality of several causes of exclusion. I'm now pleased to that other members are also here and they can add up and speak more, more in depth about some specific uh, issues that we are addressing in the inclusiveness group. I thank you. Thanks very much to you, Marsha. And that, that's a, another kind of reminder, if you would like to be a part of giving some feedback also um, to, to please share during the survey so that this particular group um, collaborating together can have your insights as well. We do have a lot of questions coming in in the chat, so bear with us as we get through them. Um, let's head to, to Ambassador Stevens. There's a question for you from Nguyen Phuong van der Bleich. She says, small states um, often have moderate views and could contribute in successful negotiations. Unfortunately, they tend to also remain silent in comparison to vocal delegations, um, perhaps with more extreme positions. How could we encourage them to be more vocal during negotiations? Uh, over to you. Sorry, Ambassador, just to unmute your mic first. I think that's the point I was trying to make. I think small states, sometimes, even though they have the I, the 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 ideas that they think could resolve some of the problems between the bigger states, they do not probably have the confidence enough to bring it out. And I believe that once they are equipped with the knowledge that they require, and they also have the, the techniques in, in negotiating, they would be more vocal. I believe that when there have been small states sometimes, mind you, that have been most vocal. In fact, sometimes when there's a negotiation, you look at a small state, it has a, a bigger voice than some of the bigger states. But these are the situations where the representative of the smaller state is so well informed and has, and has the technical issues at hand and have the confidence to, to go ahead and bring them out. Another thing to which I think small, I think it was mentioned by, I think it was by Victor in terms of off the scene, 
activities that help in negotiations too. It is also important during negotiations that maybe there's something that I do not want to say there, but I then could meet with whoever I think I could bring a solution to and talk to them. I'd be more confident that way than in a big room with many people there. So I don't, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Thanks very much, Ambassador Stevens. There is another question for, for Mr. Do Prado in particular. Um, many thanks for sharing your insights. As you mentioned, big deals are often cut in informal settings. Virtual meetings perhaps don't allow this much uh, anymore. So interested in knowing your views on how we could promote informal interactions in virtual meetings. A uh, very interesting question. Yeah, that's a great one. And I'm still struggling with this because much as you know, people are doing uh, um, web cocktails and, and having drinks, it's the human interaction is is, is different, right? So I, I, you know, there's something about um, meeting a person who you have already met in a, in an informal setting, with whom you have already had lunch and dinner, with whom you have discussed maybe some family, some personal issues. It bring, you know, it builds trust. It there's something there that makes the negotiation easier. Um, can a virtual interaction replace that? I must say I'm not yet convinced. I think we're learning. Um, let me give you an example. I've met Jerome and we've spoken on the phone. We've ne met, never met personally because we first started having contact um, in after after March. Um, do I do I trust him and I know him? Yeah, because we have had many uh, interactions. But we still keep on saying that we need to get together and have lunch. Right, Jerome? And we have not been able to, to do this uh, yet because of time schedules. I think we need to work on this. Let's work more on virtual. And I think the virtual um, uh, connection helps a lot. Um, I don't think it fully replaces. So great question. I need to think about this. Should, should we organize um, you know, um, ses virtual sessions to talk about personal issues virt uh, virtually amongst negotiators, I still find it difficult. Um, so, um, still, 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 um, uh, something to think about. Uh, and thank you for the question. Yes, definitely. I think it's something we're all uh, wondering how to best approach, even in our work environments as well. The mix between the two. So thank you for your insights there. We do have some hands up, so I'm now going to pass on to Abigail Robinson if you're there. I am here and many thanks to uh, the organizers and the, and the uh, speakers today for their excellent presentation. I am one of the, the many people supporting Shahom in the initiative you described earlier. And I'd just like to raise one more consideration or question for this, this group to consider. And that is when we think about inclusive multilateralism, how can we do a better job giving Earth, giving our planet uh, a seat at the negotiating table? And that's something we're working on right now in this initiative. I think we've reached a point where it's no longer possible to treat the environment and planetary health as separate or side issues. So the question is, how can we more concretely bring these into all aspects of governance and negotiations? So that may be perhaps through a combination of ensuring in any sectoral negotiation that we have participation from people who have expertise in issues like planetary boundaries, for example. But it could also involve creating uh, both individual and collective experiences, both prior to and during negotiations, which help us really all to connect with and be reminded of not only the needs, but also the wisdom of our planet and the natural world that, that we are also um, collectively, I think, trying to protect and preserve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abigail. That, on that note, there's actually a note um, in the chat also from Elise Buggle. Thank you very much for joining us, um, who mentions um, some very important negotiations starting on nature, um, an upcoming pledge for nature that is being endorsed by some heads of state. Um, it will be announced at the UN on the 28th of September. So she has some information in the chat um, in case you would like to, to read over that. 
we do have quite a few um, other questions coming in as well, but I know that we we do have some hands patiently waiting um, with, their, with their hands raised. So let's move on. Um, I will just quickly move over to participants. I'm sorry, my screen is a little bit slower today. Um, Jaralma Jagal Saihan, I'm, I apologize if I did not pronounce that correctly, but over to you if you're there. If you oh, are there, yeah, yeah, there, hi, there hi. we go. Uh, can Great. you hear me? Uh, thank we you very much, first of all, allowing us to participate in uh, interesting uh, training, the yeah, online session. It's, uh, it's a good opportunity for us to 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 uh, to, to learn lots of things. And then uh, there was uh, some uh, link you showed uh, during the presentation. Uh, we would like to have it if, if it's possible. Uh, that would be great help. You know, if there is any manual or guidance or some link will be very helpful. So it's just a very quick thing. I just want to, to put on uh, chat, but I couldn't find it. So uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so thank you again. Uh, for this opportunity. It, it was great. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining. No worries at all. We're, we're all uh, making our way through Microsoft Teams. But yes, to answer your question, we will be sending an email after the session uh, with the recording and some of the resources that have been shared during the session. So so thank you very much. Okay, um, over to Tom Miles. I know you also have your hand up if you're there. Yeah, thanks very much indeed. Um, I was going to um, just uh, mention why I'm supporting Jerome's project and uh, why I find this very, very exciting. Um, in a nutshell, I think it's because the, um, the, the big nation states have failed uh, in, in their job of negotiating and, and getting agreements. Um, uh, but I, I'm not going to go down that path. Instead, I had a, a question which just occurs to me, um, perhaps I can put it to Victor De Prado and Ambassador Stevens, which is, I just wonder if, if um, agreements are negotiated with a sort of uh, a deeper um, footing embedded in a, in a more inclusive way, do you think that might help to um, uh, stop states from pulling out of international obligations, which they've signed up to? In, in the last few years, you know, I mean, well, we see it today with, with Britain, um, you know, sort of apparently reneging on its most recent agreement. But, um, you know, there have been a whole host of things that have, that have happened in the last couple of years. Um, thinking about um, you know, Donald Trump and um, NAFTA and the WHO and the Human Rights Council, and, um, all sorts of things. Is, is it possible to, in some way, um, tie states in um, longer term? And, and is this uh, possibly something that could help, do you think? Thanks very much. Would any of our speakers like like to answer or have any thoughts? Yvette, you want to go ahead? I, I do have some thoughts, um, which I don't know whether I should or should invite Tom for a beer, but uh, yeah. <laughs> no, you go ahead. I, I'm after you. <laughs> well, um, let, let me start with a, with a sort of a mea culpa. I think um, um, governments would be more reluctant to uh, threaten to leave or, or, or do sort of naughty things if we, the international organizations, had done a better job in explaining what, what is, why is it that we are important. And I think we haven't done a great job at that. Because for the man in the street, you say the, the, WA, the WTO or the WHO, they might have a vague idea, but not really know how important these fora and these organizations are. So governments may be acting out of, uh, you know, short term political gain uh, in a negotiation um, and counting that people basically will not protest. Uh, and um, those who know uh, maybe can be, can be uh, convinced uh, of, of uh, you know, the, the good of the, of the short term position. So I, I think um, is there a way in international law that you can bind people to their obligations? Well, we haven't reached that uh, yet, have we? Um, uh, but I, I think what is important here is that the public and the press, Tom, uh, mm. does, does it work in explaining to people how important, um, how important the international um, uh, organizations are? So over to you, Tom. 
Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, could I say a few words on that? I believe that um, it's, it's, you know, the negotiations themselves, in terms of inclusiveness, I see that there are certain systems in which non-state actors have a, a, great, a, a, a greater voice than in others, like in the human rights resolutions, et cetera, et cetera. And the other extreme, of course, is the WTO. It's only between states. But one thing I think that in terms of holding government states res responsible for the implementation of agreements that they have signed to, I think the role within the respective countries is extremely important. I believe that the role that, that groups, non-state actors, NGOs, press, etc., play within their countries become more effective than trying to develop any rules to hold states that have not implemented it responsible. I believe that is something that needs to be done a lot more, even though it's a negotiated settlement by states, the role of, of mechanisms within the respective countries in insisting and making sure that governments meet their commitment is extremely important. Great. Thank you. Thanks very much to you both for, for answering there. And thanks, Tom, for the question. We do have a request from Jeffrey Salim Wahid as well. He could not raise his hand, but I believe he's, he's asking in the chat to, to, to give a few words. Over to you. Thank you so much, Natalie. It's a pleasure. Um, Ambassador Yvette, uh, Jerome, it's a pleasure to see you again. Uh, Victor, I've seen you in the WTO halls, but um, it's a pleasure to make your acquaintance now. Uh, just a quick point on, on multilateral negotiations. Uh, Ambassador Yvette did a wonderful job elaborating this issue. Um, the thing is, uh, when I helped chair the Alliance of Small Island States, we represented 37 members of the United Nations. Right? And as the, most, as the world's most vulnerable, we made up 20% of the UN membership. Uh, and in the UN, you know, it's one country, one vote. So in theory, with a fifth of the membership, we should not have an issue of representation. Right? But, but ladies and gentlemen, as, Yvette, as Ambassador Yvette mentioned, that's not always the case. You know, as Jerome and others have mentioned, there is an asymmetry of power today in even multilateral negotiations. And it flies in the face of our understanding and our, of our notions of what outcome documents should represent. You know, one notion in particular, having budded in Rio plus 20 and fructified by the SDGs, as Jerome mentioned, is that we agree to the notion that no one should be left behind, right? Uh, but nonetheless, when it comes to small states and you look at the body of soft law that exists in the world today, small states are consistently inadequately represented, right? So this is why a new model of negotiation is necessary. This is why I'm, I'm proud and happy to be part of the initiative uh, that Jerome mentioned and where we really do take this notion to heart. Um, and we try to take this notion to heart at every stage of a negotiation. So the participation, the nego actual negotiations and the evaluation of those. So when we talk about inclusion, you know, when we talk about having um, inclusivity across borders, across the entire world, it's important to ensure that the world's most vulnerable are accurately represented, you know, in one, in participation of a discussion, uh, two, in the modality and in the um, approach that we take towards negotiations, and three, in the evaluation of those discussions and the natural formulation of an outcome document. And also, so new modalities and, and negotiations, uh, of course, we should strive, and we will strive to build off of lessons learned, and hopefully this new initiative um, will be able to do just that. Thank you for the introduction. Thanks, Jeffrey, for, for joining us. Uh, we see you're on the go there, so we appreciate you, you being here with us. Uh, we are, we have a bit of time left, but we do want to, to leave a bit of room also for our speakers to give some final reflections. So we, we have one more question we, we, we will address, um, and that is coming from Ambassador Busayed. It's it's in relation to what we were talking about in the, in the session on the role of NGOs. He is asking, uh, how do you see the role of NGOs in being able to be part of more negotiations, especially at the lower level of perhaps communities, in, in politics. Um, do you have any insights there, our speakers, on the role of NGOs, being able to, to have a, a stronger, perhaps, uh, play in, in smaller level negotiations? Jérôme, over to you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, this question. I mean, I think what we're working on the on our side is more to uh, to rethink what can be done at the global level in global negotiations. Uh, but I think the the issue of uh, how uh, various stakeholders, NGOs, society, uh, business, uh, and others should be involved in uh, negotiations at other levels, at the national level, at the at the local level, uh, I think it is a question which is uh, which is out there, and uh, and we know also how. Uh, different it can be from one context to another. I mean, there are uh, countries where there are severe restrictions making that impossible or lack of willingness to engage uh, other stakeholders in, uh, in negotiations. And, and at times we, uh, we, we know and we see it uh, all too often uh, situations where not only they're not invited, but, uh, but uh, they're deterred from, uh, from taking part in public life. So, uh, so I think that's uh, uh, very different, but I think that's a very, very good point. Uh, and what we're looking at is the global level, but it applies also as a question uh, to the local levels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, could I say something about that? Yes, I believe that the the um, it is very important to involve NGOs in discussion. The problem, the question would be how to do that. And I believe that, again, I go back to the country level, because before countries come to negotiations on important questions, they prepare for it. And I believe that the role of NGOs in terms of advocacy at the country level is extremely important, because some of the problems of saying, OK, we open the doors to NGOs, first of all, you need to know which, I mean, we usually refer to NGO as a uniform group. And that's a problem because sometimes we find that even among NGOs, there are conflicting positions. Which NGO do you let in into a given negotiation when maybe there's another NGO that's completely... So it is a problem in that sense. The, the, the formula being adopted at the Human Rights Council in the negotiation of resolutions, NGOs participate. And, but then they all always have to end up convincing the member states on their positions. And when they do have a good position and it's really clearly um, 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 brought forward, many states would listen. I particularly listened a lot to, to the advice I got from NGOs, but sometimes I had to decide which, which NGO do I go with. <laughs> so that's a practical problem that we will have to face once we are looking at this inclusiveness. Thanks. Natalie, if I may, just, just quickly, I think Ambassador Stevens has put her finger right there. I mean, who do you trust? Who do you not trust? Who do you listen to? Who do you not listen to? But, it, but that should not, uh, of course, deter from the fact, and I think Ambassador Stevens said it, all, said it also, that they do bring uh, valuable uh, uh, inputs into the discussion, very important. And I would I would give the example of um, you know NGOs that bring scientific evidence uh, to negotiators and and here on all of the environmental issues I mean we in the WTO and Jeffrey of course uh, knows this uh, are doing the fisheries negotiations um, you know and and the scientific evidence there is is incredibly important and some NGOs do bring that. Um, that information to uh, to members, um, and of course, uh, you all have the experience of of, of climate. And again, uh, I'm sure Jeffrey has experience on on this. How important this is for a country like the Maldives, uh, rising sea levels, and of course, you know that type of scientific information is is super important. Really interesting. Thank you so much for all of those responses. Um, unfortunately. Uh, I actually, I would love to continue because there's so much interesting uh, topics and questions to ask and to discuss, but we are run out of time. So thank you very much to everyone for joining us and particularly our speakers for all of your insights. It's been really enriching for me and I hope for everyone here. Is there anything that you would like to add before, before we leave? Just briefly that um, we haven't particularly referred to academia. I think academia has a lot to bring in and they should be included in whatever we are looking at outside uh, member states. Just to thank you all, you know, it, it's always a pleasure to uh, listen to the questions and, and to my fellow panelists. Uh, there's surely much more to be said about this, this issue uh, and I hope we can continue this uh, discussion in, in some shape or form. So thank you all very much.
Thank you, and uh, I'd like maybe just to say a, a, a word of thanks to you, to Ambassador Stevens and uh, and, uh, and Victor de Prado for, for joining us in this conversation. As we've seen from reactions, and also extremely thankful for the members of, uh, of you know, my team working on that, our team working on this uh, project, and uh, there are many others uh, uh, from international organizations, from business, uh, from civil society who have joined on this idea. It is a start of a journey and a conversation, and I think we wanted to bring that conversation uh, forward with all of you. Uh, and that's the way we've been working on this project in a very open manner, testing ideas. We don't have the answers to all questions and the valid questions that have been raised, the concerns, uh, efficiency versus legitimacy of negotiation, I think is uh, is essential as a, as a question that needs to be addressed when we talk about inclusiveness. But I think we've reached a stage where you know, there's a need to reconnect uh, the global negotiation scene to uh, the people uh, who are, you know, impacted in a sense by the agreements that have been made uh, and sometimes not implemented or agreements that uh, have not been made and should have been uh, uh, reached uh, within states. Uh, and that's, I think, what we're trying to do is uh, to see whether if we expand the negotiation table uh, in ways and the modalities need to be defined, uh, whether we could uh, lead to better agreements, more agreements to uh, address the global challenges as we see them today. Um, it's the start of a journey and we are pleased to, to start that journey with uh, with you and uh, and I hope that you can uh, complete the survey uh, but also get back to us on the initiative as a whole and, uh, and continue the conversation. And we engage virtually uh, and uh, definitely Victor, I'd love to have lunch with you uh, soon, uh, soon enough. Uh, but also uh, I would love to have the possibility uh, to meet uh, with all the participants that we that have joined online today uh, and meet in person uh, wherever you are. Uh, but the beauty of online is that uh, at least we managed to connect uh, in, in, in this way. Um, so extremely thankful again to uh, UN Commons for hosting this event. Thank you very much to Jérôme, Ambassador Stevens, also to Victor. Thank you so much for being here with us. Um, we did hopefully address all of your questions. However, there are a few left and we do see also um, a comment with some suggestions on effective negotiations from Faustina. So thank you, Faustina. If you want to take a look at the chat, uh, keep going as well. So thank you all for joining us. Um, the survey will also be sent to you. We really invite you to keep this conversation going, especially with Jérôme and his team. Um, and also, if you have any feedback for us, uh, we would love to hear it on format, on what you would like to see at the Commons in, ter in terms of themes on multilateralism and professional development. Um, please let us know. You can see the details. Sorry, they're on the screen. If you want to join us next week, we already have another session. It's called Histories on the 16th. We'll put it here on the screen for you now. So a lot of the times the League has been seen as a failure. And yes, this is true in many ways, but actually a lot of the League um, and its and its developments are actually still seen today through multilateralism. So please join us. We have a lot of a lot of our um, colleagues coming from the archives, from the institutional memory section. They're fascinating to listen to. So if you'd like to hear about some of the ways, in fact, that the League is still alive today and has been contributing a lot to modern multilateralism, join us. No registration needed. Um, you can see the link there and it's also on our website. So that's enough for now. We know we've gone a little bit over time. So thanks for taking the time to be with us. We hope to see you soon at the Commons. A quick shout out to all of our speakers and also to our production team. It takes it takes a, a village to put this on. So Nadia, Nivertz, Aline, Christian, they've been working behind the scenes. So thank you so much. And we hope to see you soon here at the Commons. Have a great day. Take care. <laughs>